Hey guys, Mr. Antoon here. Hope you're doing well. Uh, today we're doing Chapter 6, Public Opinion and Political Action. And it's Sections 1 through 3. We're going to try to get through that. There's seven total, so we'll do two videos most likely. So here we go. So you can see here the seven sections. We're going to start with the American people. And what do I mean by that? Here's kind of an overview of everything. We're going to talk about how we're an immigrant society, how we're a melting pot. Some people call it a mixed salad. Uh, where's the shift happening? So it's uh, the graying of America. We're getting older and staying older longer. So it's more of the demographics of America. And as you can see here on the left, you don't know what the source is of this. But again, it's 72% white. Uh, Hispanic is 12 or 13%. African American is 1%. And then you can see here this school district here. In 2013, 2020, 2012, 2013, you can see here it's 70.8% white, 70.9% district, and the state is only 29% white. Well, this is Eames, our school district, and that's our high school. So I just want to give you the heads up of how we're looking at it in terms of comparison, comparing, and I'm just using the white because they're the majority in our district and our school, but you can see them comparable to everybody else. So there's the population on, you know, based on the Census Bureau in 2012. As you can see, that's the information. But in 2015, they kind of estimated it at 62% white and projected it at 57%. So the, the white demographic is going down at least by 5% in the next five years from now. Uh, it doesn't mean it's accurate. We're going to do one more census. That's on, it's, it's ongoing now. I think it's almost ended. But then we'll know more numbers in, in the next year, in 2021. But you can see here the increase of Hispanics, increase of Black, increase of Asian, uh, increase of two or more races. But you can see the decrease of white. And that's across the board, across our country as well. You can see the population projection from 2015 to 2060. And as you can see here, look at the white population. And there's about 50% right around here. So we're looking about 2040-ish where the whites become, they might still be the majority, but they're going to be a, a minority. They're not going to have that majority. They'll be a plurality, which means they have the most, but they don't have the majority over 51%. Um, and again, you can see here, this is in Bloomberg in 2015, the majority of American babies are now minority, that, meaning just the, the sector of, I think it's zero to five, they're the minority in terms of who's being born or what, you know, what demographic is being born. And as you can see here, again, yeah, it's zero to five, as of 2014, non-Hispanic white children stopping the majority in 2014. That's where Bloomberg uh, uh, wrote that article on that. So again, I wanted you guys to see that. In terms of us as a society, we are immigrants. You, if, unless you're a Native American, unless you know you were your ancestors were born here, you are an immigrant from another country. So we're a nation of nations. Uh, there's about one million legal immigrants per year and about 500,000 illegal. That's on average, for, based on our textbook numbers, guys. 11% of residents are foreign-born. And here are our waves of immigration from, the, you know, going back to U.S. history-ish. But you could see, again, Northern and Western Europe to 1880, 1880 to 1920, Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, Western Europe from 1920 to 1960, and then Asian and Latin America on the most recent one. And you're just seeing the groups that are coming over during that time. Annual legal immigration, you could see it going up and down. The 10-year moving average is in red. And this goes up until 2010. But you're seeing just the increase from 1940s after World War II to America. And you could see in 1988 to 1992, we had the, the most. Okay? And in terms of this, we've, we've restricted immigrants. We've, we've gone through you know, ebb and flow in terms of it. And the big one here is the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. We limited, we, not limited, we, got, we stopped any immigrants coming from China because they felt, felt like they were taking our jobs. But we've had all this legislation over the, you know, the hundred plus years uh, since then of trying to limit immigrants from coming in, restricting them. And to the point where now Trump's building a wall because he doesn't want illegals to come over. He wants them legally. He's okay with legal immigrants, but just to keep the illegals out. And that's a key by all conservatives for the most part. Um, so it, it's this American melting pot that we live in now. It's, it's, it's slowly not, you know, slowly becoming more diverse than ever before. And does, uh, do we reflect it? Does, you know, obviously Eanes and Westlake, we don't reflect it as much, but we're becoming more diverse than we used to be. 
So there's a term called minority majority. And the, the, the idea behind that is that the minority group makes up the majority of the population. So you put all those groups together. And in these states down here, the minority groups are, um, you can see currently are a minority or a plurality, meaning all of the minority groups together make up the majority. Okay, even though whites are the majority, but all putting all the other groups together in that area, the minorities become together the majority, which is really interesting. I never heard that really until I started teaching this six years ago. So it's a really cool way of looking at that. The Hispanic population is one of the fastest growing, along with the Asian population as well. But you can see, look at that, minorities are now in the majority in all of these counties. Uh, whites are now a minority. And you can see here in southern Texas, where we are, uh, all the way to western Texas to, you know, southeastern near Houston. And even in Dallas, you can see the pockets in these counties of where the the whites are a minority now. And the, and, and the Hispanics and the minorities are the majorities in those regions. And again, the coming minority majority, you can see here, again, it says around 2040. Let's see where it says here, 20, you know, right before 2040-ish. You can see it go below the 50% mark. And you can see all of these groups together would make up more overall. And this is where they'll merge around 2070, 2080-ish. Um, and I love this. What I love about this image is that this is what our expectation is. And you can see, again, the first top little thing says reluctant immigrants. The idea that they're reluctant to come over or they didn't really choose to come over. And you could say those were the African-Americans that were brought here against their will to be slaves. Yeah, that's some bad ones in term that. And that was 17% of the population. And 27% of them still live in some type of poverty as a result. And then you could see, again, I'm going to go back to this. You could see in this, this melting pot, all the different immigrants coming in from other countries, they're part of this melting pot. And they, what, what, what comes out is that they're part of the American culture. And, and whether you agree or disagree with that, this is what it's been like for a long time. A lot of people use a different one. You could see, again, you know, stirring the citizenship, stirring the, make, the, the melting pot here. The Simpson-Mazzoli Act uh, it, it forbid employers from employing illegals. And this was 1986. You could see, again, some of the stuff to try to, to stop that from happening. You could see the number of illegal immigrants. Look at the differences from what the U.S. Sent, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service says there were 7 million, and then Bear Stearns Assessment Management in 05, or from 05, said there was 20 million. Because we don't count them. They're, they're not really held as accountable as our citizens are. And again, it's something just to look at in terms of numbers. Now, we're looking at a different image here. You can see, again, uh, um, she's assimilated. She's Asian, American, most likely born here. But again, we don't know all of the information. But she's carrying that flag showing, showing that she's an American learning and ed being educated in, in our public schools, most likely, if not the private schools, we're still going to educate her on American history. So is in, in terms of culture and assimilation, you can see on the on the left is that melting pot. You sit in the melting pot. That'd be kind of scary if you're being boiled, but whatever. It's kind of funny. And you become American. The culture is American. But on the right, it's that mixed salad idea where the salad dressing is the culture, but you keep your culture. Let's say a tomato would be, I'm not, I'm trying to figure out what, you know, let's say Italy is tomatoes. Um, you keep that tomato. You stay a tomato in, in culture today because I, being an Italian American, you're keeping your heritage and your culture alive. Therefore, that tomato is whole. Instead of being melted down to become an American, you're still keeping your identity. And this is what's interesting about some of the, the cities. I grew up in Los Angeles. You, we had Olvera Street for Hispanic culture. We had Chinatown, Koreatown. Uh, we had Little Tokyo. We had all these towns where you could go to, and they have all the, the, the language in foreign languages on the signs, but you knew what restaurants to go to, and you would go in and experience that culture the way it is. That's kind of what it's moving towards. I'm not saying everywhere, but a lot of the case, it's moving to that, and that's what the mixed salad concept is. And you could see it here, melting pot, or is it a mixed salad? And you could see us keeping our cultures, uh, in, and we're all part of the American culture. I don't know if the graphic is perfect, but I, I was trying to get, get you to understand that. And then we have this regional shift going on demographically, where we have the Northeast has the most people in the Northeast of our country, New York, Boston, uh, Philadelphia, that, that region in the Northeast. But the West and the South has been growing big time since World War II. So that, that area up here, and you, if you watch the elections, they called this the Rust Belt or the Blue Wall, which, which Joe Biden was trying to keep. This area is the Rust Belt. A lot of people, the weather is not the greatest up here, especially in winter, 
they're moving down to this belt, and this is called the Sun Belt. Okay, this is where we're talking about Arizona, Texas, and Florida are getting a lot of people moving to them. And I know I'm a I'm a migrant from California, not you know, American citizen, but I, I came over to, from California because I couldn't afford the housing. And Austin is a wonderful place to live in, but I'm part of the shift as well. Even though I went from a western state to a southern state, I'm still going within the Sun Belt because I enjoy the good weather. Uh, your parents might have moved from somewhere else based on the job or the weather. Whatever the case is, you're in Austin. That's why you're taking my class. Um, and the political power of these areas are increasing because you're gaining seats in the House of Representatives. It's called reapportionment. And you can see the last time, we're still at 435. The last time we are at 435 looks like right around 1910-ish. Last time was 1904. And you can see the number of authorized. And there's the numbers that anything in dark blue have gained seats since the 2010 census. So we gained seats. Florida gained seats. Uh, you can see Georgia and South Carolina and Arizona. I can't do accents for everywhere. But Nevada, and you can see uh, even Utah. All of these seats have gained, or these states have gained. And that's the reapportionment order. Once each decade, we change the number of seats in the House based off the census. And you can see with the census, they spent $1.2 million sponsoring Greg Biffle's car, if you like NASCAR. And again, is that a ridiculous use of taxpayer money? Because they said it saved $8.5 million for the cost of conducting by advertising in certain places so people could go online and take the census. Um, again, you guys can see if it's a good idea or not. Now, look at the major ancestries by county in the 2010 census. I know it's not the clearest of images, but you could see, let's look here in Texas, Mexican or Spanish is in pink. Look at what, look at the Southwest. Uh, we have German in light blue, American or unknown, which is weird, in just the kind of the yellow whitish, um, African American in the brownish color, American Indian in orange. You can see the different pockets they have. Italian doesn't look like it's here, mainly Northeast, but you can just look at the, the ancestry by that. I love this one by Slate. They said the most common country of origin of legal immigrants. And look, Mexico is, again, looks like it's taking over America. It's kind of funny. But no, they've taken, they're legally immigrating here. But again, we take, we get, the bad is illegals are coming along too, meaning that's what conservatives are upset about. Liberals should want to be, to want to limit that because they're not paying any tax and they get free schooling based on our taxpayers. But again, it's something that you have to decide with. But here's a cool second graphic. It says here, the most common country of origin other than Mexico of legal immigrants. And it's really cool to see this one where then you see in the in invasion of India. They're coming over from India because of, again, better opportunities, better whatever the case may be for people coming here to move. You can see Louisiana, is it's Vietnam, New Mexico, Philippines, uh, some interesting ones, Somalia in Maine uh, and Minnesota. OK, so you guys are seeing the different ones here. Um, just trying to look, Cuba, China, Bhutan. So just some interesting ones. Iraq, you wouldn't think of these as the second one. Okay, and this is 2012. All right, so here's 6.2. This is about how we learn about it. What, 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 how do we learn about politics? And I think that's the big key to this. So it's the process, what determines it, and it's how, we, it's how our learnings change over a lifetime. So here we go. Here are the top three. Here's a, something, something I found about it. They're called, it's called political socialization. And the idea is that all of these affect who you are politically, but what affects you the most? I'm not going to go through each one, um, but we'll probably end up doing a journal on this. But you can see it's the family is, is probably number one. They're a central role. They're, you're there for you're with your kids. I'm with my kids from zero to 18. We were there almost every day with each other. Same thing with with you, most likely. Um, you have time. You spend time watching the elections, discussing the elections. But now as you get older and older, like people your age at 17, 18, you have the mass media. You have friends at school. They also play a major, major role. And it could be any of the following on this list here. Uh, and just understand these are the top three uh, stereotypically. OK, um, in terms of how we would vote, you could see this is party wise and some things that affect us. Look, uh, you could see here probability of voting percentage, religion, um, you can see here, atheist, born again, church going Protestant, race, white, black is way over here. You're probably going to be a Democrat. Uh, so all of these are affecting who we are in terms of how to see the chart depicts our model predicted vote split 
for a group of people who all share the one characteristic shown, such as having a postgraduate degree or speaking Spanish, but otherwise match the profile of an average voter in an average political environment. So you're just seeing some of the way, some things that affect us and how it's affected based on your party. So what would it take, and we'll do this in class most likely, to make a black voter a likely Republican? And you can see here, average voter in 2017-2018 was 53.8% Democratic, Democrat Party. And you can see if they're black, they'd have to have all these things in order to flip at the bottom to become Republican. And the other side, you could see here uh, to make somebody who was a white born, white born, white born, again, Protestant, a likely Democrat. And again, the process goes this way. You could see what stereotypically each side is affected by. And that's how you would get that person to flip uh, in the long run, obviously. And we'll do this thing on how you you click to try to, to see like a white, non-born again, Protestant, straight man between 45 and 65 who is non-regular churchgoer, unmarried, has no children, never attended college, makes that much money. You know what I'm saying? This is the chance that you would be based on voting. And we will do this in class. It's kind of cool for that. Um, in terms of who, what you're affected by, what you read or what you watch. And in terms of newspaper thing, look, it's from 50% to 76%. And since 19... 92 is gone almost below 50%. And that's 10 years ago, guys. So you know that this trajectory is going down. I can't get New York Times on my phone because they want to charge because they're losing money from that. I can't get Washington Post unless you subscribe. LA Times, all the big papers are now selling their subscriptions to your online, even though you're not getting a piece of paper. So over a lifetime, you here's let me give you some big ones. You, when you get older, you're more likely to vote. When you are um, younger, you're less likely to vote. When your income is low, you're low, less likely to vote. When you're married, you're more likely to vote. You're going to see how things change overall. And you can see the turnout rates for eligible voters up to 20, excuse me, 2008. And again, political behavior is learned, learned, however you want to say that. So the turnout increases with age. There you go. Obviously, they're dying off and they're 85. But again, the trajectory is up. I've heard record numbers of voters, young people. It's great to hear that finally. Even in 1972, when 18-year-olds were given the right to vote, they were the, the worst turnout. So you know, 26th Amendment, boom, gave 18-year-olds the right to vote, still did not turn out. But you're starting to say that you have more power. I have more power. Get out and vote. That's a big thing. That's the least you should do as, a, as an active, active citizen. Uh, increases with age. Same kind of thing. I wanted to show you that. That was from the 2000 election related to age. All right, 6.3, measuring public opinion and political information. So how do we measure opinion? This is all polls. Okay, this is one of the big ones in terms of that. Uh, you can see here the importance journalist assigned Journalists assign, assigned to various roles of the mass media. You could see investigate claims made by the government, get information quickly to the government, discuss policy, motivate people to get involved, point to possible solutions, and provide entertainment. Entertainment to me seems like we're more of an entertainment news media than we are uh, fact-based or even – it just seems to be changing a little more because they sensationalize so much now because they want the viewership, and we'll go over that with media anyways. I don't want to get into too much depth with it. So it's all about polls, guys. This is kind of what we're looking at, uh, polling. And again, there are different types. So let me ask you this question, this scenario. Does a doctor have to extract all of your blood to, tell a, to find out about your health? No, because you would be dead. That's terrible, but uh, I don't want to leave this on too long. I don't know if some of you guys don't, might, not li might not like needles. So we need a sample of the population to see how polls are conducted. We know they, they've been terribly wrong for the last two major general elections in 2016 and 2020, and you can even make that case for 2012, but it's a random sample. All we need is a, a certain amount, and the, and the, the landing number is between 1,000 and 1,500, and it has to be random. The sampling error will tell you uh, the confidence in the poll. If it's plus or minus a margin of error, if it's plus or minus uh, three, that's a good thing. That means it can go either way. It could sway, let's say it's 40% you're looking at, it could sway to 43 or 37. If it's more than that, I would not even look at that the poll. It's not going to help you guys. Uh, random digit dialing, they have computers or, or pollsters that will randomly digit or dial a certain phone numbers 
It's because it's random. They can't say I'm going to call Jeff Antunes seventh period, you know, AP government class. Can't do that. It has to be random. That's the key behind it. Uh, and they use the internet now. They actually use your cell phones. I don't really answer any calls I don't know about. So I'm probably missing polls. You could be missing polls as well. It used to be just the landlines. You pick up, say, hey, what's up? They say, would you like to get a poll? Yeah, it happened once in my life. I was really excited, but I never saw the results to see how I'm compared to others. And then they have an exit poll, which we're going to do in class. And it's really interesting. Uh, they ask about one in every 10 person who leave a poll after they voted, how they voted. And again, they give you a little thing like this. You can see it says AP, CNN, Fox. I think I can't see what this one says. It looks like NBC as well. ABC, CBS. Yeah, it's probably Fox and NBC. So you can see this is an exit poll you would take on the way out. So here's an example. CNN poll of polls. How is Obama handling his job as president? Let's say you took this in. It's just a poll in general. Uh, and you can say approve or disapprove. So it gauges the public opinion. Okay. Um, a lot of times these are, these, these are, like it says here, following rather than leading. You might not, you might see a change two weeks after based on the polls gathering data, how you feel. So it's like two weeks, it's like lagging two weeks. Um, and the bandwagon effect, obviously, like say like the, the Trump won the, uh, um, debate, which, uh, not the first one was horrible this year. I don't think anyone won, but did they get a, they get the bandwagon effect? They did really well. So then did the polls change? And that's kind of the concept with that one. Uh, there's the 2012 presidential exit polling. Obviously, you could pause at any time to look at these. I'm not going to go through all of them. But you can see, again, total male, female who voted, how they voted. Females look 55% for Obama, 44% for Romney. You're seeing how it looks based on 2008 to 2012 numbers. And that, that's CNN's polls. Um, again, exit polls, are they affecting the election? Um, it's supposed to be every 10th person. And obviously, there's always a question of the wording of the polls. Are they leading you? Are they clear, confusing, things like that? So here's the last poll from 538, one of my favorite polling companies, that stated that Hillary had a 71.4% chance in winning there the state she was going to win, and Trump had a 28.6%. So when I look at this, if I don't know anything about polling, I'm obviously going to think that Hillary's going to win. That's the pro problem we have here. Trump ended up winning, and you look up here to all of these states here. He won, he turned flipped all of these. This was Pennsylvania red, 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 okay, red in Florida. I think red in North Carolina. I mean, he really changed it. And this, this is interesting. 302 electoral votes predicted Trump got 306. Hillary got 230 something, 232, okay? So weird to think about, guys, how polls can be so off in the process. Here's the one for 2020. The last one said that Biden has an 88 in 100 chances to win the election. He has one in 100 chances of winning 400 electoral votes. He's now going to get 100 and, I'm sorry, 200, 300 right around this area here. Or I think this is plus 300 over. Yeah, that, that's not going to happen. He's going to, he's going to end up at about I think, I think it's almost going to be 306 to 232 again. So he would be like right around here. So this was closer than what these statistics tell us. And that's what I wanted to show you. So what do they, what do they reveal about our political information? We're uninformed. Most people who are actually taken the poll, they said a lot of the problems are only the people who have educations are the ones responding to the poll. They're, this random samples aren't hitting the people of all demographics. It's only hitting the ones, and if you're college educated, they're going to be skewed towards liberal or Democrats because they say the more educated you are, the more you are a Democrat, stereotypically. It doesn't mean everybody. It's just interesting to see that. Young people are the most uninformed. Huh. I'm, I'm not going to say anything about that. I think you guys are some of the smartest I've known or I've taught in my 22 years. Um, and responsible for the ill-informed electorate, is it our fault? Can you blame me? Please don't. I try my hardest. Uh, is it the media's fault? Could it be them? Because they're dumbing down our, our knowledge. They're making it really just, just, just quick and easy to get that. Is it the parents' fault? I mean, you can blame a lot of people. Look at the turnout rates between groups. Whites uh, from 2004, 2008, 2012 numbers. Look at the black turnout, Hispanic, and even the Asian turnout. You're just seeing the difference. I wish that we get at least 90% turnout. It'd be awesome to see the numbers. And this one was the biggest election ever, 2020. 
So it's pretty cool to see that. Uh, voter turnout in the U.S. presidential elections. Look at the numbers. 54, 60, 62, 57. So this one here went down. And now I'd love, I can't wait to see the numbers. I, I should have 2016 here, but I don't. But I'd love to see 2016 and, tw and 2020 as well. I think 2020 broke all records. Um, so lastly, the decline in our trust for government. So I have the stupid memes on the left here or sticker on the left. Um, do you really trust your government, guys? That's a big question. We should ask this as a poll question in class. It's a tough one because you want to trust the government. But when do we start to lose the trust? It really started in the Vietnam War when we know based on the Pentagon Papers and then what happened with Nixon, all of these things started to slide us and for us to get to not like our government because they are lying to us. OK, the, the Iran hostage crisis in 1979. Look at the decline here. You could say I have not most of the time used to be the most. And then look, Vietnam, 70s, Vietnam War, Watergate. Some of the time, never. Look how high that is at this point in 2012. That's, only, that's eight years ago. Always trust the government. It seems like the same amount of people, right around 5 to 10%. Whatever the case is, I, I can't tell you you should or you shouldn't. Because, again, um, you want to trust them somewhat. Or you don't want to be a conspiracy theorist way out there. But you, if you have you know, unlimited or not unlimited, you completely trust them. You have all your faith in them. They're probably going to let you down, especially because when you if let's say you lose an election, let's say you're a conservative Republican and you just lost 2020, you might be let down by what your government did or what your president did or whatever the case is. And uh, it's going to ebb and flow. And that's kind of where you would trust or you wouldn't trust. But when there's impeachments, when there's Watergate scandals, when there's wars that shouldn't be happening, this has caused it to erode, especially over the last 50, 60 years, guys. And you can see, again, do you trust your government? This is a 2019 poll. Uh, international problems and then domestic. Look, I mean, this is under Trump, guys. We don't trust them to handle that. This is under Obama. Boom, look at a big shot down. I think this was the Iran deal that he, that he passed in 2013. Uh, but you can see all the way back to 2001, look at the trust we gave Bush. We trusted him. And then, boom, it started to erode again. Just some thoughts. All right, that's where we're going to leave off today. I will see you on the next one. You guys take care, and I will see you later.